We are live. Hockey Nation fans, welcome back to the Hockey Nation Live Show with Cole Frenchy and the boot. And we have to go all the way to the West Coast, California, to find our co-host, Michael Bevelano. You're in here. Happy Wednesday. And are you ready for Thanksgiving? I guess as ready as anybody will be. I know. We have to be ready <laughs> with whatever is going on. We have to do it. <laughs> we Hopefully, we don't be over six people. Oh, I'm going to have 14. If you are a Washington State, you said not more than six people, what I heard yesterday. Please come into my home and get shot. Did you hear like you can go to jail or something like that? Oh, that's typical. That's not surprising. That's the most communist state in the whole country. That's Next, crazy right now. It's pathetic. We got to like fight back. We got to like, dismantle these guys. But they just reelected that idiot governor. So they deserve it. That's something you have to figure out. Yeah, exactly. They're never oh, right. We have a couple of news <laughs> around the league and in its show. Um, you know, we have a fun things going on. Let's start with the sad news happening yesterday in the NHL. The, The pass away of one of the long time. Uh, let me find it for you. Try to get it for you. Oh my God, I got it. The indigenous NHL pioneer, Frank Saka Camos, <laughs> at age of 86 years old, yesterday wow. uh, got the COVID a couple of days ago. Oh, that was in 19. And, um, and he passed away yesterday. Um, If you don't live with the story of Frank, the Fred that is, you know, playing in the NHL with the Blackhawks Chicago during the middle of um, 1950s. And, you know, the fact he was from Saskatchewan, I don't know if you, live, you know a little bit about him, but, um, you know, he was a pioneer for those, uh, you know, Indian people, like, you know, Stuart yeah. and all the kind of, you know what I mean? Those, for sure. You know, do, do you know Carey Price have something? With his mom, native, yeah. right? Yeah, he's part native. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's he, was, wasn't he, um, so when Carey Price was like 12, I think his native band paid for him to play somewhere else. Yeah, and um, I don't know if you know, my daughter's half native, she's Potawatomi. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, she's from a band that has, um, they're part of the J Treaty. So that you go back to 14, can't remember the year, but they they had part of that J Treaty between North America and the natives. And they have a band up in um, like Perry Sound on Georgian Bay. And then okay. there's one in Kansas City or Kansas State. Oh, wow. Talk about news around the league. Uh, we have one. I don't know if you follow a little bit the women's side, but the MWHL, they're going to start and play um, and um, generate 23rd until mm -hmm. right up the February 5th and Lake Placid, New York, as like the Isabel Cup playoff. Um, and uh, they'll be like on the bubble side, like the NHL start that did, and it's going to be in the January 23rd to February 5th. Six teams going to be a part of that. On that one, the Boston Pride, the Buffalo Boat Boats. I don't know, Boat. What are they? The Connecticut Whale, the Metropolitan River Thirds, and the Minnesota Wildcats, and the expansion teams called the Toronto Six. Wow, going to be a part of that part of there, and yeah, no fans going to be a part and inside the attendance at the yeah. Herb Brooks Arena. Um, so, and then the Yall Pedology Labs will provide regular COVID 19 testing with the Lake Protocol established by the WHL partner at the NYW Langone Health. So, um, pretty good, you know. What I mean, like we know the the struggle they got the last. Maybe yeah, they, they've really struggled to, to, I mean, it's, it's not fan supported for sure. And it's no, there's no TV. So it always made sense. Like Kim Pagula, I know has done a lot from Buffalo to try to help out and run that effectively. Um, I think the answer actually comes from COVID. Like I've, 
it's funny because I always felt that this should be a tournament league, you know, put make it an event driven league and make it so that it's, you know, the bubble is the right thing to try for it and then give them, there's so many channels out there, Pierre. I mean, give them time on TV somewhere. You know, the NHL network could use programming. Yep. The NBN could use programming. You no, know, the you're right. You're right about that. It, you know, it reminds me a bit of what the W, uh, the WB, um, what's it called? The NBA. WNBA. Yeah. They, they, you know what I mean? Like, it's all the about. Theory, and, 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 yeah. So uh, ESPN follow them. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, okay fan support in the, in the WNBA. Um, but the biggest thing is they get support of the NBA. Yeah. So that league without the NBA does not exist. And that's what needs to happen. You know, if you if you're concerned about trying to grow the sport for women, you know, we, girls play hockey. I've coached women's hockey. Yeah, um, I don't know if they liked me, but I coach women's hockey and I support it. I think it's a great thing. You know, no, I agree with you. We, you know, I mean, we I have a podcast travel, try to promote the hockey woman and the, the hockey, you know, around the world and do yeah. more. And, you know, for many many years they have only the woman usa in canada yeah it was completely you know uh, beat everybody by yeah. 16 20 but you can see a couple more countries now do you you're going to yeah, not bad. Bad. Yeah, I mean? yeah. yeah sweden's not bad and sweden yep. has that one goalie that kind of struck lightning so to speak and then russia's got some women you know i think it's just Grow the game. Like, we don't care what color you are or what gender you are. It's like, just play. <laughs> I agree. A couple of news right before we know we have a short a short daily show yeah, today. Right. Um, we have to talk about a little bit about um, Samuel Morin. You know, a couple of days ago, we, we go preview the, the Philadelphia Flowers. And, you know, you said, you know, he struggled every time like that. You know, the last couple of months, he got his second uh, surgery about the ACL. And now he's thinking to quit hockey and then finally come back yeah. on his decision. He's going to be the playing at AHL for the upcoming season. He's looking, thinking about from the LA Vignol to keep him in the game. It didn't mention to him to play maybe 40, 60 games. That will him, bring him back on the, his healthy side and maybe thinking more for the 2021, 2022 on an ace case for him. So um, they are. He's going to try to play again? He will try to play again on the AHL. Uh, you know, you hope he had potential to be, you know, an NHL player, and that's what you want. You yeah. want that guy to be able to play. And so I, our, he's played for Team Canada. Like, you got to hope that he pulls through on it. Yeah. Another news around the league is Jesperi uh, and uh, 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 well, end of this term with the Finland team over there is coming back at home. Wow. Um, <laughs> a, a lot of players coming back now because they are expecting the team's going to be back on a training camp the next couple of days, maybe weeks. And oh, yeah. coming back in Canada and USA, they cannot do anything for 14 days, quarantine. So the player like him, I maybe expect Joe Thornton maybe back in the next seven, 10 days. I expect for him to get back here. And you're going to see a couple of players. They are already in the NHL, not that like uh, you know, like the AHL or yeah. those kind of players. But the top of the, they are bad. The Cook and Amy case is just he came back over there because he didn't play a lot of game last season because injuries yeah. and played a level. Uh, so and also that league where you play it was not like a top notch league compared. It was one of the top best players over there. So for them, they expect more him to be back and helping. Many players now are back on the ice on fun level uh, around the, you know, the Florida Panthers, for example, they are skating every morning from 9 to 11. And you have uh, some private plays like, you know, we talk about Matthews and McDavid a couple of days ago. Uh, they are skating in Arizona. So many players are back on the ice right now. So I think that's the situation with Cook Enemy uh, to go back in uh, Montreal and skating with his, the boys, his teammates. And unfortunately, we know that you have a, an agreement the team cannot cannot have any coach with the players until yeah. they officially open the training camp, right? I guess, yeah, it's weird. But yeah. That's, a, that's the agreement they have. Uh, the you, the own coach cannot train their own. Yeah, player. they'll have they'll have like a skills coach or another player, like 
older players a lot. It's nice because you actually get to see some older guys come back and help out. And then finally, the talking about Montreal, we talk a lot of discussion around the, you know, it's from website, it's from the radio show in Canada, about the fact like, you know, the Philip Dano and his contract uh, is going to become a UFA in the following year and the people, you know, don't take a lot in Canada to start a story. So Philip Dano wants to appear in eighth playing without contract extension, don't be worried. Two years ago, it was the case, or so three years ago, you have only 25 points during that year because of the contract situation. So you want to say, you know what? It's not going to bother me this year. It's not going to disturb me. It's going to happen at the point when it'll be ready happening. I think, you know, $5 million should be all right for him. A five, six year, that'd be great. Uh, he's, first of all, he's a French Canadian. Play with Dano? Dano, you think we'll get $5 million? Yeah. It's going to be really interesting to see what he gets. I don't think people realize how good he is at being, you know, he's like in that Ryan O'Reilly Bergeron area where he gets underappreciated because he does everything very well. So it's going to be interesting to see, like, does a player like that get five mil? I so remember they have a chance to talk with Eric Belanger. Yeah. Ex NHL players. We, yeah. um, you know, his son play here in Florida hockey. We don't have his coach around here. So anyway, we have a chance to talk to him yesterday, and uh, they was talking about Philip Daniel in Montreal a lot, and we talk about this. He said, "I won't give him more at six million. First of all, second, no. five million dollar will be the the max." You know what he told me? What I was impressive. I did not think about this way. What's the most goal he make in the NHL one season? Who Dano is like 18? 13. 13, right? That's why I say, like, he's, I think 5 million might be high for him, but we'll find out. Like, I don't think six is realistic, but he, he's not, you know, that's the difference. You look at Ryan O'Reilly. Ryan O'Reilly has a multiple 28 goal seasons, leads up to eventually gets 65, 75 points. And I don't know if it's opportunity or ability with Dano, but either way, that's going to affect your contract. So when I hear five, it sounds big to me, but I, you know, it wouldn't surprise me to get 4.8 to five. So he has never been over one season, 53 points. So we have 40, 25, 53, 47. Yeah, have 13, eight, 12, 13 gold per year. My point to you is- Third line center, Pierre. Okay, then. <laughs> That's a third line center. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So because he played Montreal, because Montreal didn't have a great center like Malcolm Crosby yeah. or O'Reilly or- Not extra. Pierre, or Pierre Luc Dubois, right? The, the yeah. level that so he become what he's wearing the he's overrated like everybody. Chair. He's on the wrong chair. Does it make sense? Yeah. Well, he plays third line a lot, and he's shown he can play top line minutes. I guess you know, and he was complaining about that in the playoffs. It's like, well, I'm a second or a first line player. I'm not a third line player. Why are you matching me up against the other team's top player? But that's because like he's a great two way player and he wins face offs and he gets some points. So is that five million? I think at that moment, five million dollars is good for him. Um, that would be good. I don't think so. More at this part for me, I'm <laughs> could, you know. could you sign him at five million dollars times five years and trade him? No, but what happening is he become your best player. He's so good on the community. He's so good. He's a French Canadian. He loves them as well. His family's from Victoria. <laughs> play hockey over there he, he can go all the way over there and say you know what i can accept five million dollars they said about that's what they said about suban at five million could you would someone take that contract we you don't need to anybody he's only two no, the point is the value is he worth five million because differently you, yes yes who would who would buy who would take him at five six million nobody else but montreal okay. needs He's not worth it. Then. Pick up, who can pick up the face off? Doesn't matter. But no, I'm doing. I'm, I'm giving you why he deserves five million dollars. You, you can get guys like that for two million. Nobody. Who? Absolutely. Who? Uh, Nate Thompson is the one million dollar player that wins as many face offs as Nate Dan. Thompson can play first line with Gallinger. That's not the point. Man, man, man. Yes, that's the you point. Said face offs. I'm sorry again. Well, you could get a guy to win face-offs for a million bucks. 
But no, my point to you is like what he brings to the Montreal, what his role. So he's a I first bring well. He brings offensively. He brings a lot of pass. He brings a lot. He's maybe one of the top five, maybe eight, worst case, 10 best PK player in any You can never country. trade that contract. I'm saying? You can never trade that contract. We don't need to trade him. Then why do you need to sign him for five million if nobody wants him at five million? <laughs> That's because he deserved the $5 million for Montreal. Well, he deserves if he can trade it. <laughs> but he can be a place like him. He can like... I, I like him. Don't get me wrong. I like him. But I think to determine the value, I think emotional decisions in Montreal happen too often. But is what, <laughs> people overvalue that guy. <laughs> so who's going to get his place? Who's going to take his place? Oh, absolutely. Like you have two centers that are better than him in Kakanyemi and Suzuki. You should you really believe Kukenimi can please top line right now? The well, you line. better believe it because if he can't now, he never can. He's not ready yet. He's still not. Well, he's never going to be ready then, Pierre. He's, he's only 19 years old. What? How old is he? 20. He's 20. He's 20 and he's done. What you see is what you get with Kakenyemi. He's going to become a 60 point per year. Possibly a 70 at some point. The kid has a lot of skill, talent. He's five times better to Dano on skill wise. That's my point. He's your number one center or Suzuki. But not he's young yet. He's still he's young. Yet. Play him. We have, we, we have a young league. He's ready to go. If But you, he's not going to get better. I just. Kakenemi is what he is. He's peaked. You're going to see Kokenemi changing. You shouldn't see the playoff right now. He's going to be better what he, he did. First year, you, have a good year. <laughs> you have a sophomore year last season, like in many hey, places. Do you remember when Galchenyuk scored 30 goals, Pierre? What? Do you remember when Galchenyuk scored 30 goals? Yeah, but you, you don't compare Galchenyuk with the – Galchenyuk, it was the – right. They're both third overall draft picks. What's yeah, the difference? Galchenyuk was always sit on the front row at the bar on the Peel Street every night with his sister. So – so, Kakenemi is going to be Galchenyuk 2.0. So, Kok, so Kokenemi is not the same kind of person like Galchenyuk. They're they're both horrible people. Not not Galch, not <laughs> There's so much. It's so much bullshit in Montreal. <laughs> Why do you guys actually get some talent? <laughs> they have a lot right now. Check what happened next year. Eh. <laughs> we have to go nine minutes to go with Toronto. I know at five million dollars, you're not gonna be able to afford any of that talent. <laughs> um, you're going to see a five million dollars is pretty good, but it's yeah. time to <laughs> here we go. Today, we are talking about the Toronto Maple Leaf. I don't know why we should have just skipped them. Well, it is an intriguing story. Once again, they have an absolutely garbage playoff with different personnel. We know they had a coup d'etat where they had a world-class coach in Mike Babcock and once again using the media, namely Steve Simmons and little squeaky baby players that were upset at him. They got rid of a world-class coach to bring in their AHL coach who's never coached in the AHL before. And so the jury's still out, in my opinion, but the Keith Dubas era is full in. I think Dubas is a good GM. When you evaluate the moves he's made overall, aside from signings, and I don't think Toronto's too worried about money usually because they're so rich. It's, the you know, the one of the richest sports franchises, period. Um, their real cap would be three times any other team probably. <laughs> Now, that being said, they have to adhere to the cap. So we know they have cap problems every year because they're going to spend to that limit. So we see some pretty aggressive moves in the offseason to try to address the grit and the experience on the team, even though they had John Tavares, who's pretty experienced. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Let's see who they bring in. TJ Brody. I like this move. TJ Brody's a good defenseman. He's I maybe not, you I would know, agree with you on that one. He, he's... He's, um, you know, maybe a little overpaid in Toronto, but it's not dramatically. I think he can anchor it, still play the top four. I would like him better at $4 million than $5 million. He can't get the offensive numbers he used to get, but he's still a very good defenseman, and he can skate, and he's tough. 
So I like that move. And some surprise moves, they bring in a guy whose name I misspelled somehow. Jimmy VZ, I do not understand this move, but they bring in Jimmy VZ, the great American hope. I think he's completely overrated and not the character or player they would want, but that's the move they made. Now, then they bring in some veteran guys. Wayne Simmons, I really like this move. Zach Bogosian, I like Zach Bogosian. I thought he played very well for Tampa last year in a 5-6 role, and he'll do the same thing here for a reasonable amount of money. Then Joe Thornton. This is not the Joe Thornton of 10 years ago. However, Joe Thornton still has a high skill level. He's a big man. He wants to win. He's He played his junior hockey in London. He's an Ontario boy. Um, he, you know, guys want to come home and they want to win. So I think the desire, you know, when they said we got to get tougher, that's what they were thinking. Sims is definitely tough. Bogosian is definitely tough. Brody is definitely tough. So uh, those are guys that you get toughness without giving up a lot of skill. So there may be smart moves. You see, they bring in some other long shot guys that will help from a depth uh, perspective and maybe a little better. Miko Lettinen, we think, can probably play a five, six, seven type role and help them out. Flex between. I like that. Right? I like that. 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 Yeah, I don't mind it. So you know, when I start going through and I start being unemotional about it, I go, you know what? These are valuable pieces that can help a coach. If the coach knows what he's doing, you're going to get every chance in the world to deal with injuries, to deal with attrition, and battle through a long playoff. Now you got to get there because your best players have to be your best players. So that'll still remain to be seen. But we saw in Dallas what happens when you have a veteran player like Joe Pavelski and Corey Perry, who are maybe not at their prime, but they can lead a team in those circumstances in a short period of time. So I think that's what Dubis is looking at. Um, you know, the only thing you can do is bring those types of assets in and hope that you know your coach does the right thing and your players are in the right mindset. Uh, Dave orofsky has got you know NHL experience. He's a smaller guy, but he can play defense and a little bit of forward. Travis Boyd's had a cup of coffee in the NHL, and he's a useful guy. Um, Dennis Malgan played in Florida, and he's reasonably skilled, and he can play regular minutes if you let him, but he's most likely not going to get that, but he's a good depth player. Joey Anderson, I like this pick. Like getting him back in the Andreas Johansson move trade from New Jersey, you're giving up a lot of salary, and frankly, you get a player that is not as good as Johansson, he's gonna, but he could be. Like He's a young guy, and he's capable forward. You know, we saw he can get some points. He's still young, and he get, has a little bit of, you know, skill and grit. Um, they're looking at Russian guys like Barbanov, who I forgot to put on here. Uh, Korshkov, I don't know if he'll really if he'll even play in the AHL or the NHL. Uh, this guy's name I can't pronounce. Kivi Halme. The def- I think he's a, def- he's a defenseman. He's got to have some points. He could be a decent, def- you know, depth defenseman. Maybe he's better. But, you know, you don't look at him as better because they got so much depth. And they bring in Michael Hutchison to be a third goalie. Um, we see they moved out salaries in Kapanen and Johansson. Kapanen going to Pittsburgh, apparently going to play in Sidney Crosby's line. Um, Andreas Johansson goes to New Jersey, and he'll play a top six role there if you look at the depth chart. They bring also Aaron Bell. That's a good point. And they have another goalie. That's crazy. Wait, did they get rid of Hutchinson? No, the uh, yeah, they go with Aaron Dell on top of it. So that's Hutchinson, insane. Hutchinson came after Dell. That's crazy when you think about it, because Dell is capable of being an NHL backup, and Hutchinson actually showed in the playoffs. And you forget how many games Hutchinson's played in the NHL. So they have conceivably four goalies that can play in the NHL. <laughs> what is Rene Terry saying? You know, we know what Thornton, Simon, Simmons, and Bocasia and Brody can do, right? But I like me Boyd, Lettonen, Anderson, right. and Malkin. Those yep. guys are going to take the place, maybe the Erval and those, maybe. you know, Gauthier and those. Yeah, right, exactly. Score. They bring speed. They bring chance to score. And one kid we don't talk here is Robertson. Well, that everybody's going to be is talking about Robertson because Robertson was a 50-goal scorer in the OHL. He stepped in as like an 18 or 19-year-old kid into the playoffs, and he looked very good. This kid's for real. Um, he he is going to be a top six player. How the hell they got him, you know, this is their emphasis on skill in the draft, and it pays off. Look what? at the guy they got him. Second Bruce. time pick, right? No, he's first. He's first. He's first? But it was late. He was late. 
No, he's 52, 53. No. Oh, he's second round then. Oh, yeah, he was yeah. their first round pick. Yeah. His first pick. Well, yeah. yeah. You know, it's right around 53rd. Wow. I yeah. mean, that's crazy. So then. I was talking with the, the manager over there. Um, that's him. crazy, man. That is, I mean, what a great. So, that, again, this is why I say, I think if you look at the other players, if you look at their draft history, I think that. Dubas and team have done a very good job. Like this is, they're good evaluators of talent. They, they understand the OHL. It all started with Mark Hunter, but it has not ended with Kyle Dubas. They had a lot of picks this year and the top guy, Rodion Amirov looks like he could be a player. Like the guy looks really talented. You got Rasmus Sandin coming up. They, they grabbed Timothy Lilligren. He's taking a little bit of time. So we'll see how that pans out. Uh, you made a good point, Michael, here. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we, you know, I love, you know how much I love those those exercises because that gives me a chance to see things we don't see. You know I mean? You, you watch Tavares and Marner and everything like that. Yeah. About since 2011, right? 12. Yep. Mark, Mark and Riley, five overall pick. Thir 13, 21. Frederick Gauthier, which is yep. not about this, he's always played 168 game. You yep. talk about number eight and 14, William Nalander, 300 games over there. Now we got number four, Mitch Marner, and then you got Travis Dormat over there. Then we go back with Austin Matthews, right? So yep. we know already what he did. But number 17, he, he played 11 game. I think he yeah, can. Even Kimishov has played. Like you got guys' depth. Like, Carolina grab Bracco. I think he can play. Grunstrom's going to play in LA. Like, no, it, my point to you is you bring a great point here. They can, they know to to recruit good draft. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's um, a really good point here. Un unfortunately, I'm like tied for time, but I think when you boil it down, no matter what, the regular season, this team is going to score a lot. They're going to let in too many goals. <laughs> But they'll still get a you know ninety five to hundred points. They definitely dropped this year. The question will be, can they, you know, what do they do in the playoffs? I think they're too good, have too much offense, and too much talent not to be in the playoffs. Like they're going to be right at the top. But then, are they really the top? We're going to find out when we saw they got eliminated in the playoffs. You know, it's the same old story. So they they have to they have to turn the corner, or this could blow up. You're absolutely know. right. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the best thing you can finale this show today is Turkey Day. What, yeah. could happen, what could happen next year if they don't make the playoff or would they get out of the first round? Uh, I mean, there could be panic for no reason. I, I, I believe that the issue is going to be not Matthews Nylander or Matthews. Oh, man, I missed Marner. Sorry. <laughs> I look at the look at this. Without Marner, they get 234 goals from the forwards. <laughs> what? That's crazy, Pierre. Come on, this is nuts. Like, how crazy is that? Like, holy crow, they're gonna score so many goals, Pierre. It's crazy. It's it's a nutty situation. I mean. So now you got 30, you got 43, 56, 66, 74. <laughs> like, who does this? And then you lose, you probably got 100 here. Like, it's nuts. Like, they're going to be one of the top two or three goal scoring teams in the NHL. Anyways, unfortunately, I have to jump, but um, we can always revisit this later. I, no matter what, they're in the playoffs. And then the question is, what do they do? But they have so many depth options that if guys, pull pin in the playoffs, they'll just clear them out for the next guy. So maybe it creates a lot of pressure and competition and they get where they need to be. I don't know. It would be nice to see them get to the second or third round for a change. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Anyways, I apologize. I have to jump today early. Thank you so much. Look forward to see you tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. We have happy Thanksgiving, but we're going to be here at for a short daily show tomorrow at 11 o'clock Eastern time. Have an amazing Wednesday, everybody.